Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webcast. My name is Christine Dorsey Davis. I'm the executive director of the Ohio chapter, the American Planning Association, and I am your webcast moderator. Today, we will hear the presentation, Designing Roundabouts to Support Walkability and Smart Growth. For technical help podcast, you can type your questions in the questions box located in your toolbar. For content questions, you can also add those again in your questions box located in your GoToWebinar tool panel, and we will answer those at the end of the presentation during the Q&A. Coming up next on your screen is a list of our sponsoring APA chapters and divisions for 2022. Thanks to all those sponsors for making these webcasts possible and free to members. Today, uh, our host is the Urban Design and Preservation Division of APA. So thanks to you for joining us this year and for hosting today. Today's session. Today's session has been approved for 1.5 CM credits for live viewing. You can record your credits by heading over to planning.org, log into your My APA account, and from there you can search by today's title or event number, both of which can be found on our website, ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. If you're on social media, be sure to like us on Facebook. That's where we post uh, any important updates and uh, when new sessions are available available for you to register for. And we also uh, try to do a weekly reminder of our, our upcoming Friday session. We also record all of our webcasts and post them onto our YouTube channel. So be sure to subscribe so that you get notified when a new session is available. You can register for all of our upcoming sessions by heading over again to our website, ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. And with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Jim Barnes for the Urban Design and Preservation Division. Thank you so much, Christine, and good afternoon. And thank you again to everybody for joining us today for this afternoon's webcast. Uh, again, my name is Jim Barnes with the Urban Design and Preservation Division of APA, and we're happy to be able to host different webcasts during the course of the year. And just a brief note, our division is just a bunch of multidisciplinary professionals and uh, really looking at supporting educational and networking opportunities for not only planners, but also preservationists, urban designers, and the related professions. And we have a lot of opportunities that we try and provide over the course of the year. Our webinar collection and uh, webinar uh, program through the webcast series started in 2013, and we try and balance that out between design-related uh, uh, concepts and uh, topics, and also ethics concepts and topics. And today, we're very happy to be able to have the Dan Burton of Blue Zones and uh, talk to us about the, the design concept related specifically the roundabouts and how that can support better design and walkability uh, for your different projects and applications, uh, whether it's project specific or even community specific. Just a little bit about Dan. He is Blue Zones Director of Innovation and Inspiration and recently named one of the top 100 urbanists of all time. Dan's uh, one of the nation's top walkability experts and Planetizen uh, named him the 100 most influential urbanists. Uh, basically, uh, what Dan brings is uh, he's the most recognized authority on walkability, bikeability, and is a pioneer in people-first urban planning. Just as a side note, uh, this has come full circle for me being uh, in Florida and Dan having been originally in Florida many years ago. Uh, one of the first times I uh, came across Mr. Burden was during a bicycle pedestrian design uh, seminar that he uh, was uh, actually presenting. And it's great to be able to see uh, some of those things continue to be applicable and uh, new cutting edge techniques to some of the old solutions we he has always espoused. So. Uh, He's really helped policymakers and, and municipal leaders uh, in, in over 3,500 cities around the country to really create healthier cities and, and really looking at it even at the you know neighborhood level, breaking it down as small as possible level as, as we can. And at this point, uh, I'd like to turn it over to Dan to get us started and uh, take us through how we can use roundabouts for better walkability and uh, just better design in general. Well, thanks uh, both Jim and Christine, and and uh, welcome everyone. I hope uh, you can see my screen. I don't see the output screen, but uh, am I correct? You see this, the title screen? Yes, we can. Okay, good. So I'll just jump right in. I have become a 
a strong supporter of all things returning the purpose of streets to people in place. And near the heart or the center of that uh, are the intersections. And the intersections have been some of the most lethal places for anyone to spend any time, uh, either in a car or outside of a car. So I've always had a special interest in taming the intersections and bringing down the horrific number of casualties that occur and uh, make uh, the intersection a place. So I'll move right in uh, to the presentation. Let me see how I take control of that. I think this will do it. Okay, good. So uh, first, I have laid out this presentation in an order that I think makes the most sense. Uh, we'll get into uh, first the myths. There are just so many myths of any newer tool in transportation, and uh, there's an abundance of them for, for roundabouts. Uh, the top interest people have in roundabouts is both handling the safety at an intersection and the capacity. That's where all of capacity for road really occurs. It's the intersection. Uh, Want to cover a little bit on the economics uh, and then get into the elements or the parts or the types, and then specifically get into uh, pedestrians and bicyclists, but not overlook freight, buses, uh, uh, emergency responders, and so on. And again, uh, one of the topics I think is most important with an aging society is uh, our elderly drivers, as well as pedestrians, uh, cover quickly schools, landscaping, and the use of roundabouts for gateways. And then I've got a, a few other topics I want to build in at the end. So let's start with the myths. The, the myths, again, are very abundant. Uh, they are so incorrect, but we have to deal with them uh, if we want to get uh, a roundabout um, properly designed and built. Uh, first of all, there's a huge difference between a circle, which you're going to see in just a minute, and a roundabout, uh, there are other types of uh, these circular tools, uh, uh, including um, many uh, neighborhood uh, roundabouts and even small mini circles inside a neighborhood. So by the end of the session, everybody should be very conversant on that. Uh, they're bad for older drivers? No, they're the best thing uh, in, in an old, old elder driver setting. I'm 78, I can assure you that I prefer not to go in with the number of potential crashes and with my limited ability to do with multiple things happening all at once. Uh, the uh, left turner, uh, that is an, an elder person turning left is, is a grave danger. Uh, because there's so many things going on and the roundabouts make it easy. So um, bikes and peds are poorly served. There are just so many people that get that one wrong. Uh, the bicyclist and the pedestrian uh, uh, find that a properly designed roundabout serves them extraordinarily well, better than any other intersection tool. Um, the, uh, I won't go through the whole list, but I think everyone can see that there are just lots of myths. And uh, through the presentation, I'll dispel as many of these as I can. Look forward to any questions that uh, folks raise at the end. In concept, a roundabout can be uh, handled in a series. This is a beautiful series of roundabouts in uh, uh, Naples, Florida. I was involved in, in uh, this city first being a road diet, taking the number of lanes down from five uh, to single. And that's a benefit of a roundabout, by the way. You can take multi-lane roads down to single lane because roundabouts will handle much higher capacity, 30% uh, more, sometimes 50% more. It just depends on the loading. So uh, again, this one is really well laid out. You can see how well they treat the Pedestrian with sidewalk systems, setbacks, parking, and uh, the uh, dedicated 
bike lanes and buffers even uh, from the cars. This, so this is an exceptional uh, treatment. You saw it in concept, but here it is in reality. These are the built images of the same uh, exact angle, actually. I believe there are three roundabouts in this series, and uh, we're standing at the Tim Amy Trail uh, on the left, where further back, you can see uh, the Tamiami is up in the middle. Here are two of the roundabout. There's there's actually a third one, and these just offer superb service uh, to those using them. So let's get into the the physical properties of a roundabout. I'm going to get into the labels in a minute, but I think you can see from this uh, there are a lot of elements or parts. Uh, I love the landscaping that uh, they were able to do in the Naples roundabout here. But now let's let's do a comparison between a signalized intersection and a roundabout. In Maui, uh, at the University of uh, Hawaii Maui campus, they were going to build a fourteen million dollar overpass over this road so that the students could get across the road. And we went in and we studied, rarely is an overpass the right tool. It's an extraordinarily rare setting. And so we said, look, for a fraction of that price, you could build this roundabout. This happens to be a protected roundabout. It's it's the most advanced of all. I've never uh, gotten to experience one yet, um, although I've helped with the design phases of several. But I think you can see here uh, that now this helps with the urban development. The multi-use uh, units on the left side are easy to reach. The, the total intersection takes up less space. And uh, again, you'll see the safety benefits in a, in a short while. So let's get into that, uh, both safety and capacity. And I think they, they need to be discussed collectively together. So this is the first roundabout in the state of Washington. It's one that I helped inspire. Uh, before this roundabout got built, during school release, there were three campuses all in one general area. Before this roundabout got built, the traffic queues were a mile long in three of the four quadrants. And it, they wouldn't last long because it was all school release. But boy, during those moments, it was hectic. There were a fair number of crashes. Uh, since this was built, it's getting close to 20 years now. Uh, they rarely record any kind of a crash at all, let alone something that would be in the uh, entry producing uh, level. So amazing change on the capacity there, but also the safety. This is the engineer who created it. Um, Steve is is just uh, one of the most highly principled engineers I've been able to come across, but he is so proud of this roundabout. This is the first of what has become a series of uh, 10, I think they're up to in their community, and they also are champions of road diets, and they find the two fit well together. Uh, j just superbly uh, operated, and and again, just a home run for, for this community and the first one in the state of Washington. Here's why uh, we need to pay more attention to our intersections. A standard four cross signalized or four way stop intersection has 32 vehicle to vehicle conflicts. Most people can't deal with more than six or eight conflicts at a time, but uh, this shows you all the different things that happen. Now for the pedestrian, it's still high, it's uh, 24. But look at the roundabout on the right. Uh, we we go down to only uh, one uh, uh, conflict at a time. And all people can deal with one conflict at a time, and especially people who have visual acuity issues or or uh, other issues uh, with with abilities. And, uh, and And again, this brings the intersection down to low speed. It's guaranteed to be low speed. The engineer designs it for the speed they want, typically 18 to 20 miles per hour. And um, so just a vast number of uh, safety benefits. 
so that 90% of fatals are just gone. 70 uh, to 80% of personal injury crashes disappear. You still will have some crashes, but they're all low speed and uh, rarely uh, do they produce an injury. And, and that's true across the board. It's not just motorists. It's also pedestrians or bicyclists who benefit by the safety gain. You can see it up closer with, with this image. And, and again, notice that uh, if you were walking around this roundabout, you only have one direction uh, to deal with at a time. And uh, uh, motorists only have one possible conflict at a time. And so, uh, again, this, this uh, in human factors, this is the way to design any roundabout. Now, all intersections can be converted, but those that can uh, have huge gains. When you get up in the uh, volume of traffic you need to handle, you need to go to multiple, multiple lane roundabouts, two lane uh, typically. And in this case, the number of conflicts uh, go up, uh, but still a roundabout compared to a signalized intersection, it's a fraction of the uh, dangers. And again, the speeds come way down. And, and again, um, the engineer has full control over what the speeds will be and what the sight lines are and all the critical elements of an intersection. I was doing work in uh, uh, Orange Beach, uh, Alabama one day, and we were studying this intersection. And sadly, the engineer reported to me that uh, we have to have a multiple lane highway here as opposed to two lane, two lane plus turns. So before the public meeting that night, I built what it would look like. There was a gasp from, from the traffic engineer and she said, Dan, I, I, I can't support this. I said, well, then there is an alternative. Instead of widening uh, for, for miles and a mega, mega millions of cost uh, for widening a road like that, you can handle the volume uh, if you were to put a roundabout instead. And again, a roundabout will handle 30 to as much as 50% more volume than uh, a signalized or four-way stop intersection because everybody gets an opportunity to stay in motion more of the time. It's rare that you actually stop at a roundabout. Uh, and. Uh, this, by the way, widening was needed because of hurricane relief. So you think about that, widening a road just for the rare event of a hurricane and not having other solutions uh, to pose. Uh, but uh, again, in, in these extreme loading conditions, if the roundabout can handle more traffic, then uh, consider that a first option. Another roundabout that dealt with capacity issues was Brighton, Michigan. And in this case, a pretty high number. This is near the upper threshold of what, you, of what a two lane road can handle. And we had recommended the roundabout to Brighton and they uh, accepted that and they started to design it. But then someone convinced them that no, it wouldn't work because there's a railroad track pretty close by and big freight uh, uh, movements would hold back and build a big volume. Plus there was a, a high school. So they had ordered the signals. They're sitting in the warehouse. They're waiting to, to put them in when I made another visit. And I said, try it at least. And they accepted my uh, recommendation, put in the roundabout. The roundabout just loves to eat up the, the lines of traffic that build up at the railroad as well as the high school. Uh, I've gone back subsequently and a number of trips uh, post-construction. And the longest I've waited on the side street to get in is no more than three minutes. Now think about that. Uh, and that's peak hour, peak day, peak season. And uh, that is one of the myths that the side street traffic won't get in if your volumes on your main line are real high. And it turns out there are many reasons why the side street traffic does get in and it doesn't build. 
And this I put together to help explain why that is. Now, uh, notice the car and the, the symbol for car. Uh, apologize for my graphics. Uh, it's in the upper left that um, the car entering uh, with the signal typically has to wait 10 to 60 seconds and even longer in some big uh, intersections. With a roundabout during off-peak hours, there's no delay whatsoever. And if you were to record that and compare it, you, there's just many hours of, of saved time uh, based on, on a roundabout. So here, I'm gonna just do a little thing. The pedestrian crosses the street. Every time a pedestrian crosses the street, it opens up a gap. Motors yield, and now uh, the whole roundabout operates. So the more pedestrians you get, the better your roundabout works. A car exit, every time a car exits, it opens up a couple of the legs automatically. So that lets the side street traffic get in. If a car makes a turn, uh, that also uh, opens up the queues. And if a car pulls out of a parking space, if you're applying parking. So all of these are just some of the many reasons why uh, roundabouts uh, on side street traffic can get in and that the faulty science that was applied to say that side street traffic can't get in has been disproven multiple times. Let's move to another category, economics. This is one of my favorites. Uh, if, something, if something doesn't pencil out, it, it just won't work. And uh, so let me start with my first roundabout when I was still working with the Florida DOT. I was asked to come down here. They were getting a, a fatal crash about every 18 months. That's horrific. Uh, this is an important coastal street. Pedestrians would try to get to the beach or back. Uh, sometimes alcohol was involved and so on. So I recommended roundabout. Um, it was the first modern roundabout for Florida and they built it. Uh, and how cool, I went back, I think it was eight years after it was built and asked the chief of police how many crashes they get a year. He said, no, we haven't had a single crash yet, let alone an injury producing crash. We're up to over 20 five years now. Uh, but notice the new buildings. Uh, this actually became the starting point for re, uh, reconditioning and upgrading the entire downtown. It's a small downtown, but uh, we're talking about mega, mega millions of dollars that resulted as a result of uh, fixing one intersection here at Bridge Street. Another example, we'll get back to University Place. I love uh, their many achievements. Uh, this particular road, Bridgeport Way, uh, is a key road in, in the, the entire region. It used to be an old strip center, and uh, uh, not only did they uh, go on a number of road diets and, and uh, roundabouts, I think they're up to over 12 roundabouts now, but they, they, the city, bought this strip center and uh, are now building a fabulous new uh, town center. So, uh, so many wonderful things. Also, to talk about capacity, I uh, want to show when you're going to max out a two-lane road, uh, you have to add uh, left turn lanes, you have to add right turn lanes. Think about the crossing complexity now for a pedestrian, how many feet they go. I think I measured this uh, to be over 143 feet. That's a long time that you have to set your signal for. So you're holding back the traffic longer. But uh, same possibility, depending on loading factors, a roundabout can handle up to 25,000 uh, vehicles. So on a theoretical basis, the upper road can be um, brought down to what you see down below. Uh, it's all based on loading factors and numbers if you can get quite that high, but it's it's pretty amazing how, how much volume you can ultimately get out of a roundabout and not have to go to the multiple lane roads. Um, this is one of my favorites. It's in, uh, uh, what can I forget, Asheville, North Carolina. Uh, I had been recommending a road diet for this road for years. 
uh, Michael Mool became the engineer here, one of my, fa again, favorite engineers. This is the road before, and um, this is the road after. Notice this is a road diet, but it was this intersection that allowed us to take the, the uh, uh, road down to just two lanes, make this an easy crossing for a pedestrian uh, all, along the entire corridor, which is over a third of a mile in length, uh, just in this particular direction. Another favorite, uh, this one hasn't been built yet, but I'll show you uh, why this is a favorite. This is Albert Lee, one of the Blue Zones community. And if you haven't uh, uh, studied Blue Zones, you might want to Google it and look it up. This is uh, a street that only carried like, I don't know, 6,000 cars, uh, way below uh, any justification for more than two lanes, way below. And so we recommended a road diet. Uh, for the road, I go down to two lanes. And uh, long term, this intersection will also transform. You can see it here. And again, this is a photomorph. It's not what got built. But the road diet did get built. Uh, they're just waiting in the budget circle for uh, cycle for, for the roundabout to be built. But you can see how much more business friendly the road diet is and how this intersection, once it's gets rebuilt, will better distribute traffic and make uh, the connected downtown and the expansion of downtown um, a very viable option. So economically, uh, the roundabout is a very key uh, fundamental. Another one of my favorites, uh, this one has probably been written up more than any other. This road had to handle 23,000 cars. It was five lanes. It is Albert Lee, or I'm sorry, it is Bird Rock, uh, California, near near San Diego. It's part of San Diego, actually, but it's a complete neighborhood of itself. This is the after. Notice we were able to get angled parking on one side, parallel on the other, uh, bike lanes and sidewalk set back, everything uh, uh, go to another location. Again, five lanes down to one lane in any direction now. I believe this is a series is up to seven roundabouts and uh, very, very successful. And again, uh, highly discussed. This handles the 23,000 cars a day, no problem. Uh, here's the cool thing. They took out stop signs, they took out signals and uh, people were doing 40, even 50 miles an hour up and down this corridor. And, and feeling violated every time they hit another signal. We took out all the signals and then put in the roundabouts. And now all traffic speed along the corridor is 19 miles an hour, the best speed you can get for a downtown. And people actually get home sooner. Now think about that. Think about that bath that you're supporting the motorists in getting through your community sooner, but yet you slowed them down to where they're now going to be interested in your stores. Uh, this Long's uh, pharmacy came in and the uh, the developer said he would not have brought a, a, another uh, store like this uh, to a five lane road. He, he wanted the volume, which he got, and uh, but it, what he did not want was the speed. This allows easy access to his property. Now, um, I want to show all the variations in uh, roundabout and explain their parts uh, and the entire thing. So all roundabouts have a circulating lane. That's the key work working element. And uh, all will have a truck apron. We need that in order to get the deflection path for the motors to be correct and still allow the big trucks to maneuver around. Notice where we put the crossing, specifically one car length back from the intersection. That's where the speeds are going to be the absolute lowest and the yielding off the charts high, uh, both coming in and going out. Uh, notice they did a head bike bypass on this one. Um, the, the bicyclist has a choice of using the roundabout because now people are going the bicyclist speed or taking a bypass if, if they prefer. And sometimes families would 
sector for them. I want to contrast and compare the uh, roundabout with the mini uh, circle uh, or neighborhood circle. You can see the neighborhood circle further up. There are actually three of them. There's one to the right, one to the left as well. And uh, they're very low priced, easy to build, but the roundabout gets up into the pricing. Uh, I've seen them built for as little as 80,000, but they, they get up into the approaching million and in some cases in, the, in uh, a multi-million dollar basis. Now the circle, uh, the old rotary or circle, which you can see, uh, this almost looks like a racetrack, uh, is now gonna have four roundabouts. Uh, this one uh, is uh, gonna be so much safer and so much more efficient than the old circle. So that's the difference in size and scale between a circle or a rotary. Uh, some Something people say, well, that doesn't work, and <laughs> it doesn't. Uh, it was it was way overdone uh, before the modern roundabout was built. Uh, uh, but here you see four roundabouts will go into taming that particular circle. Here's a, a circle that, because of its historic nature, is going to remain. Uh, this is in the Sarasota, Florida area. Uh, notice they're using parking in the circle. And they made a few modifications recently to slow down the traffic on entrance and exit and made it much safer. Uh, there, there's still more they could do here, but it's, uh, again, it's in the historic Armand's, Armand's Circle? Oh, yeah, Armand's Circle. Uh, fabulous place. And uh, again, this has nothing to do with modern times. This, this goes way back, way back. We're now working in Buffalo on as many as three of the old circles, uh, historic circles. Uh, and in this case, notice some of the space we're gonna take back, the space you see crosshatched, but we're gonna keep the circle and it's going to continue to be an attractor for people to go out and enjoy the circle. Olmsted designed this and uh, as well as the other circles we're gonna work on, but uh, so important that we correct the serious mistakes. Uh, and I'm not gonna blame Olmsted. Uh, the traffic engineers over time uh, put the crossings for the pedestrians way out of place. The speeds are exotically high. And so we're gonna uh, make this a beautiful crossing and uh, honor the, the history of this great circle. Another variety, uh, and we'll call this a, a circle, but it's now into the neighborhood circle level. It's bigger than it needs to be, but actually it, it's a very nice defining space. If you could make the circle smaller, then you can get the uh, pedestrian crossings in a bit closer. This does not require the crossing islands uh, and all of that detail. And again, the price can be much lower uh, when we don't uh, have to deal with the exotics of a, a roundabout. Another variation, a um, uh, num number of different names go along with this. The teardrop design is probably becoming the most popular. Uh, barbells, another one for the same tool. Uh, freeways uh, benefit greatly uh, from, from this teardrop design. Now the many roundabouts, uh, I've probably been responsible for over a thousand many roundabouts. Um, well, first, uh, the, the full size, uh, collector road size, uh, many, is built because you reach a point where you just don't have enough room, maybe because of historic buildings or whatever, to uh, build a standard modern roundabout. And so by keeping it flat on top, uh, you're, you're able to now do the road diet, and in this case, uh, put in a, uh, a, a mini roundabout, as you see done here. One seen from the air, this one in uh, uh, Jacksonville Beach, Florida. You can see the uh, dynamics of it from here. Uh, single lane coming in uh, every direction. We'll go down and see it at grade, and again, the, the reason it's flat 
on top is to allow the emergency responders and or large freight movements uh, to be able to, to handle the intersection and uh, really done well in this case. And again, it keeps the scale down, makes it very friendly for, for pedestrians. Uh, and they can be big. Um, this one in uh, Kirkland, Washington. Rhode Island, uh, this is right downtown in in uh, Providence, right? Uh, I love it. It's it's easy for walking, biking, and it brings down the speed. Had some nice little pageantry and placemaking. Or this one in uh, London, uh, before we were building any, this was the first one I saw uh, done really well. Uh, and again, they can be very attractive and uh, very, very pleasant and really fit the, the, the uh, qualities you're seeking to, to match the, the character and uh, the history of a neighborhood. Neighborhood mini circles, um, a little different. Uh, in this case, uh, I'm gonna show you the cheapest uh, mini circle uh, probably ever built. This was done by a homeowner who worked with the city, got a permit for 45 bucks. This is over 30 years old now. And um, it's a place to come to. It's a, it's a place of art. And uh, people thoroughly enjoy this. A mini, a neighborhood mini circle that you can see in Missoula, Montana. Uh, in general, the mini uh, circle will cost 10 to 25,000, not $45. Uh, once you become involved with, with all the necessities of engineering, uh, the costs go up, but that's still a fractional cost. Seattle now is approaching 3,000, and they brought down their crashes in their neighborhoods by 93%. And they don't work just at the intersection because you can see them 500 feet off. They typically work for calming the entire neighborhood. It's my, it is my favorite traffic calming. They can also be very attractive. Holland, Michigan has two, uh, just creating a block of pocket uh, commerce. Uh, this one, and then one just like it at uh, one block away. Uh, again, very pedestrian friendly, very, very effective in uh, being a landmark spot. More typically, your neighborhood mini circles are gonna look more like this. They rarely have a full truck apron. They have maybe a little bit and uh, very little signing. Uh, 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 hope that we can get beyond where, where uh, engineers are told they have to put up the most god awful signs. And uh, this is a nice size or scale you see here. Lake Oswego is one of my favorite towns in America. They're doing just profound things to reclaim place and people. Now, uh, again, part of the myth that you can't have a, a roundabout because of buses, fire responders, and freight, uh, which is totally disproven. Uh, here you see uh, one of the university place roundabouts, both school buses and buses handle it beautifully. In fact, they don't even use the truck apron. Uh, it's there for them if they needed it, but they, they say, no, we just slow down enough that we can handle it. Uh, again, you can see it from different angles. In this case, uh, freight movement, again, doesn't need the, the truck apron. Where this one does, this is a, a, oh, probably a wheelbase of 55 feet, my guess. Uh, notice uh, they don't need the apron if they were just going straight through. But they do if they're turning left. This one was turning left. You can see how the wheels now uh, go up on the truck apron. And uh, yet, the truck apron sets the deflection path for the motorists so that they don't go too fast through the intersection. Now, a little bit of fun, uh, getting back to Naples again, this uh, fire apparatus was doing code three, heading to an event. Now by law, uh, anyone doing code three has to make, Oh, let me turn off the sound. Sorry about that. I'll go to the next one. 
by law, anyone coming uh, into an intersection code three has to stop. Uh, uh, otherwise, they're violating the law, uh, and they certainly have to uh, slow way down for for a red light, red signal. But notice this particular uh, responder took that at a pretty good speed, and uh, so I like to say uh, uh, using roundabouts actually improves response times as opposed to creating any slowdown. The um, uh, element you see here i love it is uh hamburg new york and um i had to kick my engineer several times to get him to design this uh he said dan i can't make it work the historic buildings are 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 just too close i said michael you've got to make this work this was a major truck route for western new york and uh notice what he did the truck aprons almost the entire uh roundabout but they did get a nice little place for the signs and the centerpiece and uh it just really you know engineers uh when when given the opportunity to to um make something work they'll they'll pull out all the stops and they'll figure it out they're they're good that way uh in fort pierce uh a little challenge for trucks on uh, uh right hand turns so they did a two-step curve, and that worked. And uh, again, notice the deflection points. This is what controls the speed. And by uh, using that for as a deflection point for the motorist, great, you get speeds right where you want them. But then the, the big apparatus or truck uh, can use this uh, first stage of the curb uh, for rolling over, no problems. Now let's get into the specifics. Uh, I think all folks in planning know that speed is is what we really are trying to curtail. Uh, there's no reason in the world in urban spaces to honor speed. And uh, so at 20 miles an hour, nine out of 10 pedestrians will survive. But once you get up to 40, only one out of uh, about eight will survive and uh so everything is to bring the speeds down again the entry speed and the exit speed in a properly designed roundabout and that's what i check when i go to look at someone's roundabout is do they get in the the right deflection speeds to hold the speed down so 18's good and um uh, the entries on side streets can actually be fairly tight now uh, this is a very easy crossing now that is a two-lane roundabout but the uh the entry on this one is a single lane uh so many roundabouts only need uh one lane in and out on on uh, on the side streets now let's look at how a pedestrian crosses the street note the woman about to cross now there's a queue of uh, uh cars here but and, and and the lead car is having to wait momentarily to get in. So here's the pedestrian starting her journey. Uh, the second motor's back is still kind of stuck in that position. But look at the third motor's back already yielding. And so the pedestrian is stepping down the street, and not a single car was delayed as a result of this. Again, the efficiency and and um, uh, safety of roundabouts is just off the charts high. The uh, reason we recommend 18 to 22 feet is that uh, that puts the opening for the crossing right where you want it to be, where the second motor's back then yields to the pedestrian. The first motors could have actually been a little further forward on this particular one. Getting back to Bird Rock, this is the uh, crossing width the pedestrian would have to deal with, and the signal cycle would have had to been set for that but now without signals only a 14 foot uh, crossing and the motor's desire to yield is off the charts high uh, uh it's, it's pretty amazing you can see it up close here my recommendation for for all crossings of uh, anywhere from a uh, well arterials for sure uh, down to collector roads is try to really use international markings 
12 or even 14 feet wide. This was this one was done really well. And uh, the ramps in and out and at the middle, uh, keep them as wide as you can. So that helps pedestrians uh, dramatically. Here you see, uh, in this case, this is a photo mark of one at a school. I love to use multiple signing. I just think it, at an intersection, it really gets that concept across. Uh, this also has the yield uh, pavement marking, you can see. And uh, they've, they've got the bypass lane for uh, bicyclists if the person chooses to use it. You can step up further. I don't recommend, or nor do I think this is needed on on 90% of, of uh, roundabouts, but you can add more emphasis to the crossing. And if, if uh, you've badly designed a roundabout, this becomes an essential thing. So first, design it well, so you don't need to add in the RRFPs, but this will help. You can see them done here uh, in uh, Gig Harbor, Washington, uh, or this one, uh, the person did not activate. A lot of pedestrians don't bother activating, especially if they see a gap and say, no, I'm not gonna activate it and wait. Uh, and I happen to believe that's correct. Uh, but then another step, and I've only seen this done once or twice, is you can then do a raised table crossing. Uh, so again, all these are for exotic um, treatments. We don't recommend this for, for ordinary crossings. But these tools are available and they do work. I also love uh, when we can, and uh, and often we can, to trick the motorist. Uh, notice the uh, street is only eight feet wide. Uh, uh, that is the paved portion, but the concrete gutter pan is over two feet wide in both sides. So this is actually a 13 foot opening but the motorist reads they're only getting eight feet. I, I think this is a tool we should be applying more uh, uh, to key intersections. Now bicyclists. The uh, important thing about bicycling is that those who are skilled, uh, enthusiastic and confident, uh, as well as the strong and fearless, they add up to 13% of all bicycles, all Americans who say they would ride a bike under the right conditions. But notice the uh, the turquoise, 51% of all Americans say they would ride bikes if they were made uh, safer, more friendly. Uh, the vast majority of uh, uh, bicyclists are going to want that bypass lane and for it to be designed well for mixing bicycles and pedestrians. But again, your higher speed bicyclists are going to take the lane. They know that they're now going the speed of a motorist, and they they find that more efficient. Uh, so we deal with both types of bicyclists, and uh, both both systems are important. Uh, and again, if you get a whole system built well, it's amazing uh, the breadth or or the range of people who who find it comfortable and convenient to ride bikes at uh, all ages. And uh, well, there are little things we can do uh, uh, for the bicycling side. I think this is one of the best treatments that they've done. Uh, notice they have a median island. It's actually wider than it looks from this angle. But look what they've done. They forced the bicyclists to look right, then look left before they cross. It, it's pretty amazing. Uh, I also like with bicyclists to put in the uh, lean rail, right? Like an old kitchen post. Uh, it means more will uh, hold on and give themselves that extra start for yielding behavior. And uh, here you see a Z crossing. I'm a strong proponent of Z crossings. Forcing the cyclist to hold their speed back uh, gives them more storage space and uh, forces them to look in the direction of the Pretty good. Um, this is a pretty cool roundabout. It's in Olympia. And notice they built the sidewalk nice and wide, which is good, but they also are using the bike lanes for a climbing lane in the city. This is 9% grade. Going down, there's there's no bike lane. There shouldn't be. 
you don't want to constrain the cyclist to a tight space. But uh, coming up, you definitely need the climbing lane, as you see shown here. Quickly, uh, schools are one of the best places to invest in roundabouts. This is the first in the nation. It's in Mount Pillar, Vermont. Uh, the uh, roundabout is so successful that principals from three states are coming to study this roundabout before they ask to have them uh, built in their own towns. Uh, there are over 100 now. I don't know if anyone's keeping track, maybe up to 200 now built at schools, uh, some of them multiple roundabouts. This one in Clearwater, Florida, very well designed. And so many benefits uh, to using roundabouts at schools. Not only does it help you with the traffic circulation, getting motive pointed back in the direction, but it slows down the traffic, acts as a gateway. It really sets a, a different message. This is one of my first uh, at a school. It's in uh, Honolulu. And again, this was a wicked intersection uh, before we tamed it by putting in the roundabout. School crossing guards love them. Uh, typically, uh, they can handle queues of pedestrian crossings. And, uh, and again, just a short space, all low speed. This is an actual before. And after they were going to widen this road to five lanes uh, because of volume, but uh, 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 the resident who worked on this, uh, I sorry I don't have the after photo to drop in, but this is a photomorph. But this has been built almost exactly uh, the way you see it here. And uh, just chatted with her yesterday, and she said that that 99% uh, of the motors love this. It's, it's just a better way to get to the school, away from the school. They're now gonna build a small series uh, in this area. This is Winter Garden, Florida. Uh, closing out with a couple topics now. I uh, wanna cover landscaping. Um, I think one of the most important features of a roundabout is what landscaping you put in the circle itself. In this case, undercut it so that you can see under it when you're down uh, and get sight distances. But uh, motors start slowing down 500, in some cases 800 or 1,000 feet out when it's well landscaped. And uh, you can also use that uh, center island uh, for each season. Uh, Fort Pierce does a really beautiful job. And again, seeing through the circle is totally unimportant. And no one by the slow speed is gonna make it around to where they would be a threat. You do need to see the immediate left lane. That's that's the cue. So here you see the actual sight lines of what's important for the motion to see. And again, um, this is probably a myth that you have to be able to see through, the round, through any roundabout, it's just not true. The best ones, keep that uh, slight mistake and keep the non-essential information uh, away from motors, learning to now more clearly focus on what's coming from the left. Again, so much that you can do with your landscape features in uh, a circular or, or a roundabout type event. Leading in, uh, likewise, how important the landscaping materials are. And, uh, and again, it doesn't matter what it is, whether it's a, a roundabout, mini roundabout, or mini circle. In this case, uh, landscaping really can make the intersection much, much more attractive. Fort Pierce is a, the load of uh, great roundabouts. Uh, this one was designed beautifully on a grade. You can see how well they uh, treated the architectural details. I love it. Another one in Fort Pierce a beautiful uh, quality that they put into this. Uh, I'm gonna close out on gateway roundabouts. It's, uh, every community should have strong, compelling gateways uh, saying, you're now with us. We're going to treat you differently than whatever you were doing back out there. And so um, not only what, what you do with the landscape materials, but what you do with your buildings at a roundabout. And again, you can get them in close, you can celebrate your ruralness or whatever the character of the neighborhood is. Um, 
And then I'm going to close out real fast with with the multi-lane roundabouts. I haven't focused heavily on that because they're more rare. But uh, once you get into uh, handling the volumes of traffic in your community, you'll probably get up. This is one of the first and notorious roundabouts. It was built early on with a fountain in the middle. They spent a lot of money uh, building that roundabout. They took a very complex set of intersections. Uh, I think there were four intersections and uh, it, it kept the number of people that could get to the beach way down. There's like a five mile queue of traffic trying to get to the beach. But with the roundabout going in, there's still a small queue on the very peak days, but it's it's minutes now instead of uh, what had been over uh, two or three hours. Again, you can see the details. The side streets only need single lanes in this case, but the but the high volume uh, get gets uh, two lanes. And again, um, you can see it in, again from the air with with uh, a number of the the details. With a multi-lane roundabout on the key legs, you do need two car lengths uh, as opposed to just one. That's one of the big differences. But notice again that the, the uh, smaller streets coming in only need uh, uh, one car space. Okay. And finally, I'm going to close out with uh, some of the ways that we can use roundabouts better. So notice this. Uh, is a really tough road in, in Orlando. Uh, there were hours a day where, where there's just long, long traffic queues with the signals. But they're proposing a development here, and I'm recommending that they use roundabouts to get the motors coming in to be able to bypass the uh, the the big road, right? And if we can do that, notice the green line for the orangish line that by building additional roads as part and a quality and a necessity of a new development not only do you get more people to come and visit but you you untangle the key intersection uh, by doing that university place you got to see the downtown earlier uh, they got built uh, they they've got uh, a total of three roundabouts that are helping with this Notice they're doing the bypass down below Bridgeport. Bridgeport runs through the center. And then upper, eventually, they'll do a, a uh, new street above. And that will really fuel uh, their new downtown center. So with that, uh, I'm ready, Christine, uh, for you to take over and see if we have any questions. And thanks, guys. Great. Appreciate this. And boy, do we have questions. So let me organize my screens here. I'm going to stop showing my screen if that's okay. I got it already. I got gotcha. you. Oh, you do? Okay. Yep. Okay. So um, first question is kind of technical. You had mentioned um, the intersection of Route 128 and East Street. It was an image. What town was yeah. that in? Do you remember? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, East? Or Route 128 and East Street. Boy, um, I gave the street, but I didn't give the town. It sounds like Charlotte. No, you look, might have. No, you I'll might go have. back. I'll go back and okay. uh, check and see. I'm sorry. Okay. All right. Uh, first question here for pedestrian safety. There's a lot of questions about pedestrians and crosswalks, so let's dive in there first. So sure. for pedestrian safety, what is the advantage of roundabouts versus tightening that right turn radius and adding a center median? Sure. So for pedestrians, roundabouts, uh, you no longer wait for signals. Uh, virtually all motors will yield if you design it correctly. Uh, you, there's a slight out of direction travel, but it's very minor. And so pedestrians get through an intersection much sooner with far less threat uh, because of the low speeds and, and the yielding behavior of motors at lower speeds. Motors will yield at low speeds. They will not yield at high speeds. And so the potential for a crash goes way down and the ease of getting across the intersection goes way up. Yep. 
So it's not really an issue then of vehicles not seeing the pedestrians. It's more about the speed itself. So it's not like, you know, um, vehicles are having to like look to see if they see a pedestrian. It's more about the speed than anything else is what you're saying. That, that's correct. Yeah. Once you bring down the speed, the motors has far more time to see the pedestrian. So, so the visibility is increased. And um, because of the very high yielding factor, uh, the, the pedestrian finds it very easy to get across the street. Over the years, I've gone to virtually every intersection, every town I've worked in uh, that matters. And I rarely get motors to yield to me even if I'm wearing fluorescence and I'm making it very clear my intent is to cross the street, uh, it's rare that I get a motorist to behave. Uh, but in roundabouts, it's like 95% uh, of the time the motorist wants to yield to me. Yeah. Okay. Um, so how do we handle bike lanes with a mini circle? Um, is that even a thing? Or do you need to transition to a full round of it? a full roundabout to handle bike lanes? Well, first of all, bike lanes do not go through any intersection. Uh, so we end the bike lanes before any intersection and we pick up on the opposite side. Uh, that keeps them, the pedestrian or the bicyclist out of the danger of right turning mo motorists and other conflicts. So the, um, the roundabout, in that it's only um, a single lane, it's not marked as bike lanes, becomes much safer for everyone. And uh, we we do provide that bypass lane in almost all cases with design. So I hope that answers the question. Did, yeah, did, did that answer the question? Perfect. Uh, this is, yeah. this one is, is Interesting. Um, can you touch on uh, visually impaired pedestrians yes. as to how they are to cross a roundabout? Um, how does that work? Yes. So, um, and thanks for asking that question. The visually impaired pedestrian, it has obviously many challenges now that cars are quieter. And it's, it's necessary for them to be given the guidance of where the crossing is. So we do recommend the curved ramps as opposed to the non-curved flanges, which points them in the right direction. Their crossing distance is very low. And, um, and again, our challenge today is as much because new electric cars and other cars are so quiet, uh, they need some, some acuity, uh, provision cues, uh, but we train our engineers. Uh, we, do, we done it in our own town. We bring all the engineers together from the whole region and put them through a training course and have them be blind uh, for, for that exercise so that they understand uh, how that low speed in, low speed out is the most important thing that they can do. And they do pretty good at that once they understand that. So. Uh, the big thing is to keep the crossing short, keep the speeds low, and then a person who's caning or has a guide dog will do well. And by the way, I did a review of a roundabout in Gahanna, Ohio, that was very poorly built. And uh, with a woman who was blind, 100% blind, uh, with her guide dog, with me in, in fluorescent colors, we could not get a single motorist to yield to us because of that extraordinarily poor design. I'm happy to report that I just drove through it uh, a week ago and it's been rebuilt. So always focus on the needs of our elders and anyone with a disability and especially blind, but we can do it. Um, the very complex two lane roundabouts may require some additional operational uh, controls. Um, what uh, factors prevent roundabouts outside of like their actual construction themselves um, from, from working? Are there instances when the space is too small, when there's just too much? Um, what are the instances when 
a roundabout shouldn't be considered? Great question. And uh, I think the important thing is no engineer ever wants to make a mistake. And so they will do models. Uh, there's very good uh, uh, software now. Uh, before anything ever gets built, they'll know what the levels of service uh, will be, how much land it will take up and so on. So one factor that controls if you can get a roundabout in or not is the amount of land you have available to you. Uh, and too many engineers underestimate, or I'm sorry, overestimate how much land they need. Uh, they can be built with less land and so on. But uh, the amount of land is a factor where the buildings sit, if they're important buildings, uh, that matters. But I think the other thing is there are cases where you need a string of roundabouts in order to have one roundabout work just because of the loading factor. So signals will build up and then want to send all that traffic out in one fell swoop. You may need more than one roundabout in order to get uh, one of the roundabouts built, you may need to look at some of your other intersections. And again, the engineering community has such great software. Sidra is the one we recommend. It's an Australian brand, but uh, all this is done before any intersection actually gets modeled for an intersection. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, Let's let's talk about double lane roundabouts for a moment. There's still some there's a lot of questions about how safe they really are and how complicated they are and whether or not pedestrians should be involved at all and whether people are really going to be able to drive on them properly. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Yes, I uh, recently uh, did a whole project around Brevard. North Carolina, they're building, I think it's in the end, it's gonna be five uh, dual lane roundabouts. And the first one they did, they made a number of mistakes. They didn't uh, have a way for the bicyclist to, to uh, work their way around. They put the pedestrian crossings too far back and made a few other uh, errors in the speed that motors could come out of the roundabout, things like that. So you need your top engineers to work on two lane roundabouts and they should be peer reviewed. We've gone back and corrected so many now that were not well designed that we recommend that you not only hire the best, uh, most experienced engineers, but that you give them the criteria. They've got to work for walking. They've got to work for bicycling and not make any more of these mistakes. Now, Oakland, Michigan, was was truly the county uh, that so poorly built two lane roundabouts that it brought on all the added features now required by ADA nationwide. So um, you know, we went nothing but the best engineers that have the most experience before we go to two lane roundabouts. Always try to get your one lane roundabouts in first. And uh, with that then make sure you're you're getting good engineering, and and again, we recommend peer reviews. It's just an important step for for a person cutting their teeth on bigger roundabouts. I hope that helps. But I'm for yeah. multi-lane roundabouts, but I don't want to see poor poor ones built ever again. Yeah. Um, is there a threshold though, regardless of if you have a double or and it has the best constructed roundabout? Is there a threshold where the number of uh, vehicles is just too much and there's fail there's traffic failure and there's backups? Is there a point where it doesn't work? There is, and um, that threshold uh, we're still testing, and it's all on loading factors. When is your traffic going to come, and how big of queues and things like that, and um, Again, I'm using the range of 25,000 vehicles for a single lane roundabout, but it's all got to be modeled by Sidra or, or another piece of software so that you know what the delay would be. And typically, uh, you can handle numbers clear up to that level. Uh, in some areas, it may not be quite that high. Uh, now, for a two lane roundabout, I don't 
know the upper threshold. I know we've been building them uh, clear up into the 40s. And uh, I'm, I'm sure I can do some research and further answer that question. But 25 is, is, is definitely the upper threshold. Uh, by the way, there is a roundabout in uh, Daytona that was built uh, and ran for decades at 35,000 as a single, um, but they eventually replaced it and with a different design, it can't handle that much. So <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm, I'm reasonably confident you should be building your roundabouts to help you with your road diets too, to keep the the, the traffic moving on a road diet and get away from five lanes and four lane roads and uh, make them all safer. But yeah, I would say generally 25 is an upper threshold for a single. I hope that helps. So um, when you're at the modeling stage and um, let's say you're in a community that's um, near malls, or you're in a summer town or a town where very specific parts of the year there's way more traffic than any other point of the year. Um, how do you take that into effect? How do you take that um, or into account when you're doing this kind of modeling? Do you model it for your absolute top limit, um, even if it only happens five days out of the year or one month out of the year? Um, how do you balance that? Sure, and I think that this is such an important question. We shouldn't be building our roads for for the five percent of the time that we're going to superload them, right? Anywhere near a near a college, for example, during the six home games a year, we should not be designing for that. We should be moderating the traffic release, things like that. Uh, likewise, uh, we should not be designing, say, a beach community uh, for for the uh, three or four holidays a year. We should be designing them for ordinary weekends. Um, but even then, be willing to accept that you're at your destination. You're you're in there. You've driven six hours to get here for a reason. Uh, plan on spending an extra thirty minutes getting to your hotel or whatever, right? And um, we have overbuilt for the peak peak moment. Um, and we're trying to get uh, planners and engineers say, nope, we're not going to do that anymore. That was dumb. We're not going to supersize our roads, our intersections, um, our parking lots for that rare event. So I would say no. Uh, and, and there's good guidelines uh, for this in planning and engineering is Use your models, know what your delays are going to be. If you can mitigate with with other uh, non-supersizing things you can do uh, to to get the the road to operate the way you want it to 95 percent of the time. Yeah. Great question. <laughs> um, oh yeah, we got we still have, we have a lot of good questions here. So um, let's talk about communicating the benefits of uh, a roundabout. Uh, I'm going to mush a couple questions together here. So one, how do we better inform the public of the advantages of, of roundabouts? And then two, how do we uh, better inform, educate uh, our decision makers, our, the the, staff, the city staff, either our engineers, you know, the mayor, council, whatever it might be um, on the, the benefits and kind of reframing them from looking at, you know, an intersection with stoplights or, or stop signs to like shifting that perspective over uh, to a roundabout. How, where do we start? How do we do that? Great. Um, you know, I got into this field uh, not for the technical side, but for the public engagement side. I saw project after project failing because we couldn't explain it to the public or uh, or to our elected leaders and sometimes even to staff. So I think that's the beginning point is we, we uh, come up with a list of the very best videos that uh, now exist, Federal Highway Administration, uh, the National Insurance Institute, many, many people have develop really good videos that explain. Uh, but it's the 
going into the neighborhood or going into that business district or wherever and working at uh, appropriate what we call informed consent uh, the the older way of doing public engagement just doesn't work and so for, so for 30 years uh, in my career I've been working to how do we inform people about how new tools work and get them to champion the idea and take the pressure off of the elected leaders of having to be the champion or find the right elected leader who who totally gets it totally understands it and is is backed up by their community it's a you know it's it's not just true with roundabouts it's true with road diets it's, it's true with anything we want to do to progress to return our communities to people in place is we've got to have a good way to to help train whoever we're working with, again, at the neighborhood level, find the champions, point out to them that their ideas will not go forward unless uh, they can overcome uh, any resistance they're gonna find and be there to defend the idea and not put the onus or the pressure on their chief engineer or their, or their mayor or city council member. What a great question. Um, this is an interesting question. Uh, how how do how does light rail work with a roundabout? Can it work in conjunction with a roundabout? It, it absolutely can work, and it just it goes right through the middle. Uh, I should have put in a, a couple. Uh, the um, light rail uh, obviously needs special signals when they go through. Uh, but those signals are so easy to install and get the motors not to enter the roundabout while light rail is going through. Same with trains. Uh, we've got three or four in Florida uh, that I'm aware of where big freight has to go through the roundabout and it works just beautifully. But yes, we have uh, good solutions for light rail and freight and freight trains. Okay. Um are you um, are you aware of any studies that look at or if you or do you know of any studies that look at the life cycle cost savings of signals versus roundabouts um, or research looking at the benefits of roundabouts ooh in storm events um, that's an interesting uh, like oh, safety yeah. benefits of intersection continuing to function um, so I guess that's kind of two questions so one life cycle cost savings of signals first roundabouts and then secondly research looking into the benefits of roundabouts in, in regards to natural disasters i guess yeah uh first uh signals are expensive uh not just to put in but to, to maintain uh, operate the electric the, the maintenance fees uh they can run 35 to 65,000 um and up uh for per year for, for all those services, we're around about nothing, nada. Uh, so you can put all that amount into landscaping or or just as a chalk it up to savings. For for uh, storm events, uh, when um, Hurricane Andrew hit Miami decades ago now, the it, it knocked out so many signal heads that uh, I think it was four years before they could uh, get the factories to build enough new signals to replace the old ones. So a uh, huge cost for, for uh, trying to maintain signalized intersections during big storm events where uh, roundabouts, they don't care. <laughs> you know, if you get temporary flooding, it goes away quickly. And uh, so uh, for, for the future, for climate uh, sensitive places, uh, roundabouts are another chalk up this as a win yeah. great question okay uh i have another good question i'm interested to hear about this um what and there's actually a couple about this um what about roundabouts on um institutional campuses whether whether it be a university or an airport or uh uh an Air Force base, I don't know, um, or, you know, even an industrial site, you know, where it's 
there's just a lot of roads connecting. Have you have do you have any examples of that? Yes, uh, we're we're building more and more uh, roundabouts on campuses or key roads into campuses. Uh, again, keep in mind that campuses typically have a peak loading factor of class breaks and things like that. And if your your street, the way it currently operates. Uh, needs to be widened for for the campus purposes. Uh, uh, the the issue is, do you want to widen the road and make it impossible to bike or walk to campus, which should be the preferred mode, or do you want to keep the the uh, roads there and therefore a good quality intersection tame enough that it works? And I, again, I like to add the value of the 30 to 50 percent higher capacity. Uh, as a as an asset that that is going to save you mega mega millions if you can cannot have to widen. There are a number of campuses. I haven't worked on any specifically, but um, a couple of the campuses in Michigan uh, and uh, Alabama now are using roundabouts on campus. I think up to thirteen roundabouts in in. Uh, and I'm I'm sorry since I didn't work on it, don't know which one. Military bases um, will benefit by roundabouts as well because again you have peak arrivals, peak departures, and uh, both on the campus and then approaching the campus. Uh, this is a very important tool to consider. Uh, by the way, I didn't mention it um, specifically, but I recommend every community adopt a roundabouts first policy uh, that if roundabouts will work you build that if it won't work and there again as we discussed reasons why they won't work in a particular site then great go to your next option um, but always uh, consider uh, going with a policy in your community of roundabouts first i i, I want to say it was outside of sedona I was driving with my husband, this was years ago, and every cross intersection, every single one for miles and miles was a roundabout. Do you know what I'm talking about? Do you know where I'm talking I about? Do. I do. I do. I've studied, I'm like, I've studied uh, Sedona from the air, and I'm so proud of, of Sedona for figuring out they're keeping the speed slow. They're, they're uh, not having to widen the roads too much. That, no, right. Sedona is a great model. Thank you. Thank you for having discovered <laughs> i'll never forget that because i have never been through so many roundabouts before in such a small stretch it was yeah. pretty it was you know it was pretty cool to go through of course it was you know plenty of cool. nerds that we are right um yeah. so i think we have time for maybe one 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 or two more uh, uh questions um so <laughs> Once we get a, uh, a roundabout installed, and let's say it's a fairly significant roundabout, it's not a mini neighborhood roundabout, how do we teach them how to properly use the roundabout? I know a, a roundabout was just installed maybe two miles from my home, and it's a two-lane roundabout. It's pretty, it's pretty significant. And I'm there are like flashing lights, flashing signs. All, all the arrows, all of the extra signage, and uh, frankly, I think it's it's overwhelming because you're looking at almost too much, and you're not looking at the road. Um, yeah. how, how do we how do we help residents in the best way possible to learn how to properly use it and not avoid it, and also not you know yeah. jam on their brakes when entering it, you know, all of the yeah. possible issues that could happen. How do we avoid that when yeah. the roundabout is, is first opened? This is a great question to to uh, head out on. Uh, I think, first of all, this is not something we should overthink. Uh, typically, when we build roundabouts, it takes a number of months, and people are already operating in them uh, before the official grand opening. So that will handle mm, 80, even 90 percent of the people are going to be using the roundabout. There are very good uh, short videos that communities have come up with as well as print literature uh, you might want to check that out uh, again uh, they're so well done they explain them so well i my personal preference is just to go 
to Google and check out what are the latest uh, and, and check through them. But the National Institute of uh, Insurance uh, probably has one of the most classic uh, that's been around for a while. But get that widely distributed. Bring your media out to the roundabout or or help them get to a community to study the ones that are already working. And the, the greatest challenge is a community that gets a lot of tourists. It'll be their first time into a roundabout if, if the state doesn't have a lot. I live in Port Townsend, Washington. We have two big uh, or two single lane roundabouts that are on our most important entry into town and i love to go there and sit in the parking lot this sits kind of high and watch motors come through and i think if i were able to interview i would find out that i hand uh, of, of the people i think are tourists they actually are <laughs> but the the worst thing is is that during the early months of a roundabout uh, you're going to lose a little bit of efficiency uh, just because people are getting used to it. There are a lot of people that all they need is one time in a roundabout and they've got it all figured out. And there are others, they need 30 times before they'll figure it out. And anyway, um, the learning curve is, is going to get easier and easier as more and more roundabouts gets built in your state um, or, or in your region, at least. People are going to start to realize the mega benefits. What a great question. Thank you. Um, okay, I think we're going to go ahead and, and wrap up a couple things before everyone starts logging off. We are recording this session. We'll post it up onto our YouTube channel probably sometime on Monday. So if you want to share this with friends and colleagues, feel free. Um, don't forget to register for our upcoming sessions at uh, ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. Don't forget to record these credits, one and a half CMs. Um, and uh, if you're interested in learning more about uh, roundabouts or road diets or uh, traffic calming, um, make sure you put that in the little comments in, in the survey that pops up here at the, at the end when you log off so that we know um, if you're interested in kind of learning more about some of this stuff and getting a good refresher. So Dan, thanks for joining us today. This is really good. Um, and Jim, I know you're in the background from the Urban Design and Preservation Division. Thanks for hosting today's session. Everyone have a great weekend and we'll talk next time. Bye-bye.